Um, I used not to introduce myself, but we have new people coming every time, and so I, I've started to introduce myself. I'm John Henry, the chairman of the Committee for the Republic. For those of you who are new, uh, the mission of the committee is to gather citizens of all political persuasions uh, to talk about what the two major political parties won't talk about. Now, Congress has just voted for the largest military budget in the history of the world. The fully loaded cost of our empire is closer to one and a half trillion dollars than it is to a trillion dollars. It's fully loaded. The drive for empire has been undiminished over the last 3,000 years. The peoples, the geography, the places, the, the times change, but the story remains the same. In that sense, history is but an illusion. Ecclesiastes taught what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Experience has proven that truth with the certainty of Newton's three laws of motion. Like more than, <clears throat> like more than the 60 preceding empires, the American empire fights for the sake of fighting. Propelled by our multi-trillion dollar military industrial complex, our empire will eventually collapse like the Roman Colosseum. Now this is hotly uh, denied uh, by those among us who believe that we're the new chosen people destined to rule the world. Our imperial delusions reached a high watermark in President George W. Bush's second inaugural pronouncement. If you remember, he said, the policy of the United States is to end, quote, tyranny in our world. Bush would have profited by reflecting on the following exchange in Shakespeare's Henry IV. Glendower, quote, I can call spirits from the vastly deep. Hotspur, why? So can I, and so can any man. But will they come, will they come when you do call them? <laughs> but the leopard can't change his spots. As the British Empire dissolved on his watch, Winston Churchill crowed, quote, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, unquote. Now tonight we have, um, we're fortunate to have one of the, I think five, five or six best uh, writers today um, on foreign policy here, and pa Patrick Lawrence. I don't know, Chaz has had him on the uh, listserv and I uh, read something he wrote and I got this book. <clears throat> great stimulating book, uh, his last book, uh, called A Time No Longer. And Patrick, uh, in this book, regrets the almost childlike innocence that we uh, displayed in response to 9-11. Patrick argues that we had a choice to throw down the poison imperial chalice. So why do so many Americans cling to a failed national narrative? The intoxicating belief that our exceptional status places us beyond the limits of our species, the limitations of our species, and the dictates of history. Patrick wants us to accept that our national narrative has failed and to abandon our dreams of empire and dismantle our imperial presidency. We are doomed to tyranny without separation of powers, to, which is predicated on the wisdom that we're not all angels. Instead of embracing the constitutional exceptionalism of the American Republic, the Democratic and Republican parties continued to lead America down the militarized path of telling the world what to do. Patrick hopes for an America that can cast off manifest destiny, out damn spot, and go back to a people 
Grounded in the reality and the pride of the example we set each day when we choose to march to our own drummer. Patrick, come and tell us how we march to our own drummer. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a special thing to be sitting in a rural village in Connecticut of 1,600 souls and uh, the phone rings. This gentleman on the other end has uh, taken the trouble to read one of your commentaries and then taken the trouble to buy the book, uh, the book that brings me here tonight, uh, and then pick up the phone and ask me to join you here. Uh, I'm very grateful for that, John. Um, and uh, very honored to address the committee uh, whose work I've admired from a certain distance for a while. Uh, I'm on their list, your list serve and all that. Anyway, since I address you as a hack of a certain age, I'll begin as I was trained to begin long ago with the pyramid method. You put the most important thing you have to say at the top and all else follows in descending order. So your editors can cut as they inevitably will do from the bottom up. And if nothing is left but one sentence, you've got your point across. So here's my lead this evening. How sweet it will be for our Republic when the day arrives on which we admit we have failed. What splendid vistas will lie before us when we at last accept that our idea of who we are and what we are meant to do in the world has been defeated. In short, we are a nation desperately in need of failure and defeat. We need these things precisely so we can realize ourselves and our great underserved potential in new ways and as fully as we can, this for our own sake, but also certainly for the world's. When I write this kind of thing in a column or a commentary, I feel compelled to remind readers not to miss the optimism beneath the apparent pessimism. The impression I have of the committee for the Republic is that no such guidance is necessary, so I won't belabor the point. I assume we share an understanding that to get anywhere in a given endeavor, you must begin with a clear-eyed acceptance of where you are, your starting point, whether it be bitter or sweet. Uh, so where are we? This is the obvious question. What is the endeavor? Is the follow-on line of inquiry. Americans, always with dissenters who count as part of the American story, have lived a long, long time with the idea that we are an exceptional people, a providentially chosen people with special things to do on earth. This is the essence of the mythology at the root of our national consciousness. Taking my date from Winthrop's Eyes on the World sermon, we're eight years away from marking four centuries of this, these sort of mythologically generated assumptions. Later came Manifest Destiny in the editorial of 1845, then Wilson's and his Universalism, then Henry Luce's American Century, then our obnoxious post-Cold War triumphalism, and Fukuyama's End of History thesis, and I have to ask you to consider whether something can be obnoxious and supercilious at the same time. Always a renewal of the ideology, more or less intact. For my money, every president since Wilson has been a Wilsonian or a neo-Wilsonian or a closet Wilsonian or what have you. The think tanks in these parts seem to be full of Wilsonians. It's, it's, it seems to be in DC's water, actually. Then came September 11, 
2001, and all changed, changed utterly, to quote Yeats, and for now I'll leave out the line about a terrible beauty being born. Uh, we will probably have to wait a while for that. I take September 11 as the uncannily abrupt date when the orthodox American narrative finally failed. I'd like to explain why I choose that date. It was on that morning that we had long, that what we had long told ourselves about ourselves and ourselves among others, the story of our exceptionalism proved illusory. We can all remember the television newscasts endlessly looping footage of the collapsing Twin Towers in Lower Manhattan. It seemed to me almost immediately the wreckage we obsessively watched was merely an objective correlative, to borrow the literary term. The blows of greatest magnitude were to our hearts and minds. We had lived for centuries on the assumption that history as Toynbee wonderfully put it, was something that happened to other people. We considered, ourselves, we considered ourselves immune from it, and indeed from the depredations and uncertainties of time itself. And when we talk, I'll explain if anyone's interested where the title of my book comes from, Time No Longer. All of a sudden it landed on us that we weren't immune in these ways. The issue instantly became whether we could accept this. In an equally powerful jolt to our collective psyches and a closely related matter, the American century as Luce proclaimed it in his uh, life editorial of February 41, also ended that day. That's again, my argument. There are many ways to understand this, these endings, but drawing from Luce's text, no longer could Americans exert upon the world the full impact of our influence for such purposes as we see fit by such means as we see fit. What, what brilliant hubris, right? <laughs> as I saw it, the events of 2001 confronted us with a choice. We could have accepted that our national narrative had failed at that moment and that we had entered a new time and faced new circumstances. This would require of us imagination, our native wisdom, a necessary measure of courage. And we Americans are not short of these things after all. They would have guided us well as we walked on unfamiliar soil and found our way in a new unmapped landscape? And since when are Americans afraid of unexplored territory? Or we could resist our new century, I'm calling it a post-American century, and enter a state of denial that would lead us into all manner of destructive uh, conduct. I gave us 25 years to make this choice, counting from 2001, as it turned out, those who purport to lead America needed far less to choose wrongly. We have made a lot of messes since 2001. We make one in Europe and, and Ukraine as we speak, and we can hardly make another one with China, hardly wait to make another one with China. But we have never since that day been able to do what we want, where we want, as we want, not with any kind of result or benefit or to our benefit or anyone else's for that matter. There's no trace of creativity less in it, left in our foreign policies. As a departed friend used to put it, we've assumed the role of spoiler. And how infra dig is, is that? Our unwise course since September 11 leaves us more or less paralyzed in a very awful place. We are suspended between myth and history, is how I put it. The one failing us at last, 
the other inducing fear as it beckons us forward. William Appleman Williams titled his last book, published five years after Saigon Rose, and I prefer to put it that way, I hope you don't mind. Empire as a way of life. This is where we are. Hooked on a faded, collapsing hegemony that cannot be salvaged, and in any case is not worth salvaging. Very saliently, the choice those who purport to lead us have made has deprived us of something we greatly need during this passage in our long story. Here I'm gonna draw from a wonderful book by Wolfgang Schivelbusch, the German writer and a good student of America called The Culture of Defeat. This book has made a big difference to me since I read it some years ago. Wolfgang makes an eloquent case for the value of defeat and the perils of victory. A defeated nation must retreat into itself and think again. It must face the reality that it had it all wrong. All that it had assumed was enduring and superior in itself had failed. So the defeated are forced to reconsider their worldview, their identities, and all that they had assumed to, assumed to be so. In this process, Wolfgang argues, lies the promise of rejuvenation, of renewal. To acknowledge failure is to open oneself to new ways of doing things, to new understandings and identities. In time, the vanquished can return to the fray and present themselves with, to others in a new and imaginative way that answers to the painful discovery of past errors. Victors, by contrast, continuing with Wolfgang's thesis, work on the assumption that they've had it right all along, they have proven out, and all they need to do is keep on keeping on, as we used to say. Victors have no need to think much about anything. When John invited me to come see you, he remarked in the, the telephone, what a pleasure it is to speak to someone else who thinks. Of course, I took that very kindly, but let us consider the subtext. We have made ourselves into a nation that no longer thinks very much. One of Wolfgang's studies in the culture of defeat is the American South. He writes in that chapter, victory like revolution can devour its children, particularly those who expect more from it than it actually delivers. This also is where we are, enraptured by the post-1945 decades of primacy, caught up, especially but not only when we look across the Pacific, in a pitiful, unbecoming nostalgia for the once was but no longer is, Nostalgia, I have always thought, is a form of depression that seizes people who cannot bear the present. Maybe it is evident by now, and this goes to something I had a conversation with one of you about over drinks, uh, that I think our present predicaments two decades into a new century are at bottom psychological questions or have a pronounced psychological dimension. To advance from our present condition, I argue, requires first a new consciousness, a new idea of ourselves. So I'm gonna to turn to this briefly now. In The Promise of American Life, 1909, I think, Herbert Crowley asked whether America can transform itself from a nation with a destiny into a nation with a purpose. It's kind of a drag that we still have to answer this question 110 years later, but uh, this is one way to describe our project today. It leads us, uh, destiny is the, is the stuff of exceptionalists. It leads us into or provides alibis for all our semi-sacred missions. 
the militarization of our vocabulary is a minor obsession of mine right now. Purpose gives people agency, earthly things to do. It makes us, not providence, responsible for our decisions. To me, this is the transformation we need to make from destiny to purpose, a variation on from myth to history. The question before us is what we propose to do once we have got this done. What kind of nation do we wanna be with what kind of policies? What will be our purpose? I define the objective as a post-exceptionalist America. Much else, and maybe all else, will flow from this, it seems to me. This means that before we get to do any, doing anything, there's a very great deal we have to stop doing. This means we must cease doing all those things America has long done in the name of exceptionalism and its insidious sibling universalism. All that has to stop. We must withdraw from it and in its place begin to contribute to an orderly multipolar world in which international law reigns and different histories, traditions, cultures, priorities, and political frameworks and perspectives are not merely accommodated, but taken as a given and respected, and in time I would say valued and even celebrated. I will be forever damned if most Americans, properly informed, would not choose an orderly world over military, material, and ideological dominance. All of us, were we to have leadership with the guts to embark on a new path, would soon discover that our claim to exceptionalism and all the responsibilities it imposes upon us have been an immense burden. And how fine it is to imagine the relief when this burden is lifted, or better put, when we lift it from ourselves. Imagine a world where a multitude of voices and sensibilities are aroused to address tasks, challenges that are common to us all. We would address this problem this way. Well, we would address it this way. Uh, you know, new ideas. Um, what new ways of thinking would open to us, providing we have the courage first to open our minds and escape our obsession with our own voice as the only one in the world needs to hear. I, get, I address this gathering with some constitutionalists among you, I gather. John's made that crystal clear. This suggests to me that you are already well aware of the path forward. It lies in a return to the ideals we long ago abandoned and to the rule of law and our just claim to exceptionalism legislative exceptionalism are we calling it right that's human made exceptionalism not providential right? uh, important distinction um this will meet will more than do as we seek fundamentally to alter our course an alternative foreign policy based on respect for international law instead of this rules-based order people bang on about uh, the dismantling of the military industrial complex and all its associated apparatus in the national security state, a rebalanced economy, an end to the official lawness, lawlessness that's rampant all around us, a rethink altogether of our place in the world and how we should conduct ourselves among others. All such advances require only that we live by the principles we claim to espouse but have long ignored. I'm well aware, as I'm sure you are, of the enormity of the transformation we're discussing this evening. So be it, I say. The magnitude of the task does not constitute an excuse for not undertaking it. I read it in just the opposite way. In my, in my view, the magnitude of the task is a precise measure 
of how urgently we need to get going in practical ways. The French have a wonderful word I've, I've liked for many years, uh, otherworldly idealism, you know, boy, boy scouty, they call angelism, right? And I'm, I'm sometimes charged with angelism when I uh, talk about these things, although I think I accuse myself more of it than others accuse me. I reply with a mention of Bergson and how he understood the coming of great change. So I'll end with this passage from his final book, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion. It was a brief elaboration on one of his big ones, Creative Evolution, where he made the case for what he called our élan vital, uh, a sort of spirit or innate energy that drives us forward. Here is what he said about how fundamental change arrives among us. It is a leap forward, which can take place only if a society has decided to try the experiment. And the experiment will not be tried unless a society has allowed itself to be won over, or at least to be stirred. It is no use maintaining that these, this leap forward does not imply a creative effort behind it. That would be to forget that most great reforms appeared at first impractical, as in fact they were. I'll end there, friends, and thank you for coming this evening. Okay, good. Let me get uh, Bruce. Is this the mic on? Yeah. Um, well, it's a wonderful presentation. I have a couple of observations. It's not clear to me that um, you no know, defeat necessarily ends in uh, rethinking. Uh, certainly, that wasn't what Germany rethought about itself after World War One. It led to World War Two. Uh, the French that lost the Franco-Prussian War didn't learn anything. We didn't learn anything in the Vietnam War. It is. It is working. Oh, maybe I'm not. Apologize, I'm not holding it close enough. Can you um, reprise? The yes, so uh, let me start over again. Um, I, I think you mentioned that uh, oftentimes victory um, is like Pyrrhic victories. They cost more than they gain uh, because the winners become arrogant or uh, afflicted with hubris and defeat often is preferable. They, they learn nothing. Right, but I'm not sure that applies equally to those who are defeated. Did we learn anything in the Vietnam War? You know, we're back to where it was or even worse. Uh, right, did the right. Germans learn anything in World War I or uh, the French after the Franco-Prussian War? Anyway, I think that the problem that we confront is more than winning or losing wars. It's why we go to war at all anyway. And you castigated, I think, the idea of American exceptionalism. Um, it's surely insofar as it believes we're born with different DNA, that is uh, clearly false and uh, creates this arrogance and going abroad in search of monsters to destroy. But certainly the framers did think that we were exceptional because we understood we weren't angels and we needed checks and balances to prevent us uh, from engaging in uh, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must foreign policy. And that's why we're exceptional in entrusting the, the war power exclusively to Congress. Now we don't comply with that anymore. Uh, we're, so our exceptional constitution, which, as you know, Gladstone praised as the greatest work ever struck off at a single time by the brain and purpose of man, and Gladstone didn't flatter easily, um, is that we did have an exceptional constitution. Uh, we did, uh, despite winning the Revolutionary War, didn't become uh, enamored of the idea that we were flawless and could move forward just by remaking the world in our own image. So I think the, the problem that we have is 
We don't actually honor the exceptionalism enshrined in the Constitution. We abandon it for empire and we see what the result is. Thanks. Thank you. A lot of moving parts to your question. I, I'll, I'll take the ones I can remember and remind me of the ones I did. Okay. First of all, uh, <coughs> We didn't learn anything from Vietnam because we never admitted we were defeated. What I'm talking about is a, a, a sound four square acknowledgement uh, of a given polity when it is defeated. We didn't do that, right? Um, uh, I'm not a student of the Franco-Prussian Franco War, but interestingly, one of the examples uh, Bush gives in the culture of defeat is indeed what happened to the French after the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, the Germans, World War I, okay, I understand your point, but World War II is a, is a perfect case of what we're talking about, I think, right? Uh, the Germany of today has nothing to do with the Germany of the 30s and 40s. Um, about exceptionalism, uh, I need to make some distinctions. Uh, when I use the term, I'm talking about a religiously based chosen people consciousness, okay? Um, I am one way of looking at this is all nations are exceptional. All nations are exceptional. That's a defensible proposition, but no nation is exceptionally exceptional. That, that's where we are in my view, right? Um, uh, our chosen people consciousness is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the ideology of exceptionalism. Uh, constitutionalists such as your chairman are talking about the, the exceptional uh, advance of legislative power in the 18th century. That's man-made, that's, a, that's a, a fact on the ground, as we say. That's man-made exceptionalism. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a perfectly legitimate assertion of exceptionalism, right? There's a third thing I wanna mention. Um, it's just slightly tangential. And that is the use of the term exception when we say a state of exception, right? A state of exception. This means maybe some of you know, it means the giver of law stands above the law. He who renders the law is not bound by the law. Uh, and this is also part of what we're about now. It's a, it's a part of our imperial uh, pretensions. I think it's related to the kind of exceptionalism I talk about here and in the book, but it's quite different, you know. Uh, uh, what did I miss? Well, I think you, you covered anything. I think you made clear that if we were exceptional in the human sense of yeah. That's my point. Uh, I think that now you've clarified or narrowed the condemnation of exceptionalism, and I agree that's what's been transformed into. That was not the understanding of the framework as their exception. They yeah. Last year, yeah. they thought they wanted to have anybody above the law. The law, yeah. the rule of law was king, the king wasn't law, was the model yeah. of the American Revolution. Yeah. yeah, he's saying, he's not saying that the, uh, the, the founders were a failed narrative. He's saying that moving off of our operating, our foreign policy operating outside the Constitution is a failed narrative. Okay, so who we got? Uh, Jerry, I call on you. I'm, I'm gonna keep you in reserve because you you always got a question. I wanna, so we've got some new people here. They've got this charming lady who is in the, um, she assures me she wasn't, uh, an English legislator from uh, Rottenborough. She was from a... Uh, 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 
Thank you very much. Um, obviously, since my background is actually I'm born of Irish parentage, but brought up in the UK. So I have two different histories that I look at. Um, being an Irish woman, you look at the English rule of Ireland. I will say no more than that, except that Bernard Shaw got it right in his play St. Joan when he said it is wrong, the point of that play, which was written in 1923 after the establishment of the Irish Free State, is it is wrong for one country to rule another. And I guess that's what I abide by. Now, getting to your uh, American exceptionalism, um, obviously, in a way, that's a foreign concept to me. But what I look at with America in its constitution and its commitment, certainly in World War II, is its commitment to freedom of thought, freedom of expression, the ability of individuals to pursue, as I think your constitution puts it, uh, life and happiness. So that is my view of the role that America has, has frequently played but not always successfully. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned in passing that the Germany of today is not the Germany of the 1930s and the 40s. Absolutely right, of course. But why isn't it? Because first that Hitler was defeated and all the evils that Hitler brought in his train. And secondly, communism was defeated, thus freeing East Germany and its citizens to pursue freedom of thought and freedom of expression. And what I'm finding difficult with your presentation is, I'm not sure what you mean when it applies to actual events and what in practical terms you think should be done or not be done. I will mention another point which is a different gives you a different angle on this and that is iraq and the invasion of iraq i actually when i was a member of parliament i chaired a committee representing disappeared women and children in iraq so i knew a huge amount not all of which i revealed at the time of the extent of the torture and evil that so many people endured in Iraq. Now, I would have a different point here. I felt it was right to remove Saddam Hussein. The problem was that the failure was, was after the war was won, instead of establishing something like the Marshall Plan, which established and strengthened Germany and it put it in a position to pursue the kind of ideals, I would say moral ideals, to which I fully subscribe. The failure there was to understand Iraq, was to understand the complexity of Iraq, and to understand how you needed to help to rebuild Iraq, but under something like a Marshall Plan where expenditure is controlled and tracked, which was not done in Iraq. So this is what I'm finding difficult. Do, we, do you mean that the pursuit of freedom in the sense in which it's outlined by America so strongly in its constitution and is pursued by the UK and now other member states of the European Union? Or do you think that that is the pursuit of an empire and something to be decried? I'm not sure because I need to have specific examples of what you think should have been done or should not have been done, and precisely why. She's given you a free, free, free run there. You can go. Uh, first of all, to take the question that floats right to the top, we had no business conjuring a bunch of nonsense about the about Saddam Hussein and starting a war. All right. 
we, we had no business conjuring a bunch of lies and nonsense about Saddam Hussein in order to start a war there, which I, if I am not mistaken, I don't follow these numbers precisely, which cost what, a million plus lives? This is a defensible proposition? I beg your pardon, right? That's an example of what we should stop doing. Uh, I, I find the notion of, you know, uh, sorry. I, I find the notion that it was okay. To, I, I never had Saddam Hussein home to meet mother, but that's not material, right? There are a lot of rather unfortunate, nasty people in the world. Is it America's business to take care of all these people? To, uh, I love this, I, again, the militarization of American vocabulary, to take them out? No, uh, not, a, I, I, I see no case for that, to, to put it plainly, right? This is what we have to begin doing, stop lots of stuff, right? Uh, in the way of what we should be doing, we should be learning to see from the perspectives of other people. We, we are not gifted in this way. It's an accident of geography to an extent, but uh, it, it's, it's also uh, a matter of our consciousness. We don't see from the perspectives of other people because we don't think we have to. We're not gonna get anywhere until we overcome that. I teach journalism uh, once a year at Colorado College, a course in how to be a good foreign correspondent, right? And I tell them, if even if you're in this class and you don't really have any plans to be a journalist, this is something every American needs to learn how to do in the 21st century. We have no gift for it. We have no taste for it, but we need to do that. And much else will, will flow from that. Uh, another point I, I wish to make, uh, especially during Bush II's administration, so much was made of American freedom, right? American liberty. I thought to myself, actually, you can think what you want in Belgium. You can think what you want in France or Brazil, right? We are not unique in that way. Uh, we, are, we did very well uh, enshrining these principles. Who could, who could not be proud of the language in our founding documents. Excellent, okay? But we chose, the, the, the fundamental choice America chose, had in, when do you wanna say, 1898, was democracy at home or empire abroad. I think that's in a certain way what the election of 1896 was all about, right? Uh, and we chose wrongly. We chose wrongly. Yeah, okay. So what we need to understand the Ukraine crisis is something our press constantly deprives us of, right? which is historical context. You mustn't remember what happened if you're going to buy into the idea that this is this ridiculous word, Russia's unprovoked war makes no sense whatsoever if you have an understanding of history right so that's my take right uh, we ignored repeated expressions of anxiety repeated expressions of of eagerness to get something done uh, uh, most recently putin uh, along with um, chancellor merkel and Emmanuel Macron uh, structured these Minsk Accords in 2014, 2015. Those accords were intended to answer to the character of Ukraine as one of those unusual nations that sits between East and West, right? The East of the country is very oriented toward Russia family ties, language, political tradition, and so on. And the West 
is oriented toward the West. Uh, and the Minsk Accords were intended to make this work and preserve the unity and sovereignty of Ukraine. How? Well, I remember I did a lot of columns on it at the time. You couldn't use the word federalized. For some reason, that was a word too far. But that's what they meant. And you can use it now. Uh, that's what the Minsk Accords were about. The, the, the Kiev regime uh, was never serious about them. They, their first post-coup president, uh, Poroshenko, came out earlier this year saying, you know, we had no intention of implementing those Minsk Accords. We just signed them because it bought us time to fortify ourselves in the East so we could attack our own people, right? That's, you know, poor, uh, that, uh, shocking enough, but who's Poroshenko after all? A, a chocolate magnate, right? Uh, Merkel said the same thing last week. We never intended to, to enforce the uh, Minsk Accords. We wanted to give Ukraine time to rearm. How do you think that made Moscow feel? They worked, you know, Putin sweat bullets over those accords and tried to get them enforced for eight years while the Kiev regime was constantly shelling cities, i.e. civilian areas in the east, killing uh, 14,000 died, I think 80% uh, of that figure were in the east. Um, uh, and these were Russian speakers, people to whom Russia feels a certain, or for whom Russia feels a certain responsibility. So that's just the most recent example of what we've been serving up to the Russians. Um, and hardly am I first to say it. The reality is when Russia says this is an existential situation for us, we can't, uh, we can't just dismiss that. It is, it is. Last December, a, a year ago now, um, in fact, I think it may be a year ago this week, uh, Moscow sent two treaties, draft treaties, one to Brussels, NATO, and one to, or was it NATO or the EU? They sent it to Brussels anyway, uh, and one to Washington in draft treaty form saying, basis of negotiation here, let's talk this over. Wendy Sherman, for whom I have not one iota of respect, right, uh, said, non-starters, the press being wholly unoriginal uh, these days, went long on everything. Every time they were mentioned, they were non-starters, non-starters. Uh, we never gave them the slightest concern. This is why we are, do, we are in the fix we're in now. Again, I could go on and on, and I'm sure many people here could, but that's, uh, that's uh, is that satisfactory? Do we, do we, does, any, does anyone want to follow up on Ukraine? Because uh, I want to stay on Ukraine. You want to stay on Ukraine? Patrick, thank you very much. What is the end game? This is why I want to follow up on Ukraine, because we have an end game, and is, is that to reverse the humiliation of Afghanistan? Is that to a continuation of what we uh, began during the Cold War and thought we had successfully concluded in 1989? Where do we want to go with this? Because obviously we're not stopping now. Yeah, I, I, I have to qualify. I don't have much of a claim to superior wisdom on, on this, but it, it looks to me uh, I've written this in a number of columns. Uh, it looks to me like the Biden administration um, determined that 
this is our shoot for the moon, big roll of the dice moment, and we're going, we're going for the subversion of the Russian Federation. That's what I think. Um, but again, I, I'm not privy to discussions, right? I, I think uh, just a little background here. I think Biden, the Biden administration, in a certain way, uh, got stuck. Uh, he became president when the music stopped, right? Uh, it was either it was either get serious about the 21st century, or uh, get perversely serious about pretending we weren't in the 21st century uh, when it when it be, it began to become ever more preposterous. Uh, you know our our refusal to ignore the, the denial I was telling you about in my comments, right? Uh, you know, I think this guy's stuck. I, I, you know, another problem that he's not a very smart man, but uh, um, I think he got caught, so to speak, holding the bag. And the problem is, uh, you know, 70 years of primacy, the foreign policy cliques, they forgot how to think because they didn't have to. They didn't have to think. Just keep doing it. Just keep keep on, right? Boutros Ghali, uh, who I quite liked, um, when he was shoved out of the UN by the Americans, um, wrote some really lovely memoirs. Uh, and he concluded them saying, diplomacy is for weak nations. The strong have no need for them, right? Um, and this is, uh, you know, if if things are if you're if you're a, an unchallenged hegemonic power, what the heck? You don't. That's true. But we're in a century where it really matters. Statecraft matters, and we we don't seem to have a gift. That's a little background. To Hi, um, my name is Mark White. And I had the incredible good fortune to be at a forum hosted by Edward Lysonsky, um, who's a personal friend of Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Huh. Um, and Bob Dole and Jack Kemp and a few others. Um, and at that forum, I had the incredible good fortune to be bop around Moscow with an aide to Congressman Rohrbacher. Oh, yes. And a couple of other people. And the reason I'm telling you this is um, me and the congressman's aides ended up in the Kremlin where they had on the bleachers, pardon our inconvenience, we're hosting an international family values conference. And we just can't not have the bleachers here. Um, the pastor that I was with told me that the Obama administration pressured them, the Obama administration pressured American clericals not to go to a family values conference in Moscow. Um, our establishment, not you, me, or anybody else here, but our establishment basically flushes down the toilet any kind of working relationship with Russia. And I will go further. I have known a very large number of Ukrainian Americans who want nothing more than to encourage antagonism and I, I can give you names later on if you want. They want nothing more 
than to encourage antagonism between Russia and the United States so they can make money. How do we deal with that? How do we really get away from the military industrial complex flushing us down the toilet? If I knew the answer to that, I'd be a much more powerful person than I am. <laughs> um, yeah, the how of it, right? I was, John's been telling me about um, his uh, efforts, his group's efforts on Capitol Hill regarding the War Powers Act, right? And my reply was, you know, John, uh, it's a fine thing, fine enough thing to write columns calling for an alternative foreign policy. But how much finer to, to be able to write a column saying, and this is what people are doing about it, right? Uh, so that's, you know, the how of it is, uh, it's a large and very interesting question, but I would start with, with things like uh, what John is doing, right? Uh, uh, to uh, gain some influence in the legislature, indeed bring congressional power, restore congressional power instead of these, to end these decades of gross irresponsibility as regard war making powers, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Ac actually, that leads into my question is if you, um, <clears throat> a, little, little, a little more powerful, what would be the top three bills or two or three bills you would introduce into Congress to sort of get us away from what's probably a little too much uh, warfare as our first uh, response and, and a little more towards a more responsible country? What, what would be two or three practical bills that you yeah. think we could introduce? I, you know, when, when I wrote my remarks, I, I was very aware that, um, you know, I wanted to keep it general because John had told me we'd have an extensive exchange afterward, right? Uh, but I also thought, you know, I'm, I'm not brilliantly schooled in that kind of thing. It's a great question. Thank you for it. But uh, what bills? I, I can only suggest, I don't know what bills. Maybe John wants to intervene. Here comes John Henry. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce Fine, uh, we, we have three three pieces of legislation yeah. that we want to see out. Yeah. The first, I think, to um, at least get uh, Putin to think about uh, Ukraine and Europe not being an existential threat is to have Congress pass a statute that removes us from NATO. Uh, the precedent goes back to 1798 when Congress by statute eliminated our defense treaty with France and the Supreme Court has held for over 100 years Congress can supersede treaties by statute. Uh, and I think that if we're out of NATO, uh, NATO is a paper tiger and no longer an existential threat. But the second thing that we can do, it seems to me, is to have Congress enshrine neutrality as the permanent foreign policy of the United States until and unless Congress votes to declare co-belligerency or belligerency. Um, so then we actually have a debate and Congress, as you well know, in over 230 years, only in five cases or five clashes did they declare war and only when we actually were or were believed uh, see, confronting aggression that had already broken the peace. But otherwise, uh, Congress, even when Obama asked for a declaration of war against Syria, even hawks like Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz balked and said, no, we're not going anywhere like that. They don't want to go. They want to vote on war. They tell you that openly. If it goes south, let's blame the president. They force them to have the vote themselves. They'd shy 100 times over. Uh, and a third bill that could be introduced is simply prevent the United States from stationing any troops abroad, uh, any military resources abroad without the express consent of Congress. And it can force that with the power of the purse as they utilized in Vietnam to end the Indochina war. Yeah. This is a great. Thank you for that. Uh, these are great practical, you know, they're wonderfully concrete, practical replies to you. I'm very grateful for them. Okay. All right. I want to call on, uh, you haven't. 
Yes, on, on Ukraine. I, I'm Barry Wood. I like very much what the lady said about freedom and promoting it. This is the dilemma. The Republicans and the Democrats, if they were to vote on anything about Ukraine, it's more, more, more. Yeah. And the situation is so dangerous that the prospect of escalation from Patriot missiles, Mearsheimer argues that troops are next. I think the question that we're all somehow concerned about is what can we as citizens do to try to educate people on the kinds of things that you were raising. Henry Kissinger says, we don't have a plan for what we want. We don't have any statement of our purpose. And this is vital. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what can we do? Well, we're doing it now. Uh, we, we need to, what do I want to say? mobilize is not quite my word but we we need to educate ourselves each of us educating others around us right um i'm kind of a child of the 60s uh, i don't see anything wrong with the street frankly but uh that was then this is now i you know that doesn't seem to be uh, going on but the anti-war movement whatever one might think of it um uh, had its impact, right? Uh, a friend of mine said the other a couple of months ago, the anti-war movement ended the war. I said, I beg your pardon, the Vietnamese ended the war, but we did make our contribution. You know? So I think getting, pushing things into the into public discourse. Right? Yeah. So so what what do you think our war aim is? What's the the war aim? What, how does this end in Ukraine? In now, Ukraine? Let me say that. We, we've voted out over $100 billion. Europeans have put about $15 billion in. Yeah. So it's about five to one. You know, we're carrying this. We're paying for this war. Yeah. And there have been 17 vote, uh, 19 votes, 17 clean. And uh, Tom Massey, and <clears throat> there were three votes against the first, and they got to 57 votes against the Ukraine aid on the 17th vote. And then the leadership put it, wrapped it into on the uh, bigger bills for yeah. the 18th and 19th vote. Yeah. But we're at over a hundred billion, five to one. And where is this going? Where, yeah. how does this end? You know, uh, I mentioned good old App Williams, uh, empire as a way of life. We are hooked on it. And uh, uh, he didn't, he wasn't referring to, it's sort of a late in life book. Uh, the sort of thing Chalmers Johnson was writing just before he died. Uh, uh, he wasn't talking about just the policy cliques and bureaucrats. He was talking about all of us and our, whether we wish to acknowledge it or not, our dependence on uh, I'm the gonna... Imperium, right? Um, uh, I, you know, I, I think, uh, well, I'll leave it there unless you want to go further. Dan has a question. Yes. I'd like to uh, explore the idea. That oh, some, that some, yeah, hi. Forgive me. And <laughs> somebody might introduce a bill, and this strikes me as being extremely popular uh, on both sides of our great divide that we should not allocate. $1 billion for foreign adventures or foreign efforts that aren't isn't equally allocated to America. Yeah. You know, if they if they're getting 100 billion, we need 100 billion for all our vast domestic problems for our housing, yeah. for our child care, which is the worst in the in the Western world, the developed world, and on and on and on yeah. one for one, you want to yeah. spend the money on foreign wars then spend the money domestically and that tie it tie the tie the money and uh, you thanks for the question and the point and it allows me to reply to john's question which i neglected a minute ago i got caught in other things but uh, look um the the choice between empire at abroad and democracy at home 
is very stark choice. We've made it, or those who purport to lead us have made it. So this is not a situation where, in my view, okay, uh, this is not a situation where we can kind of negotiate, uh, okay, you want a foreign war, all right, but but we want a hundred, we want the same amount for childcare, healthcare, education, bridges and roads, whatever, right? I don't think, in all honesty, I, I have to say, I, I don't think it works that way. It has to be a more decisive approach, right? We need to end things, not accommodate things. It's too late. The hour is too late, it seems to me. Well, yeah, you know, but I, as I, as I said, the magnitude of the task is not an excuse for neglecting it, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's try. Is Todd, can we get him with it? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you're real loud. Turn him down. Okay. I just wanted to make this very quick. Uh, I've put on the chat a couple of things, comments about we, we, why we need to understand George L. Moss explaining how Germany's culture became so militaristic. And that's what goes to the problem today with passing these bills that we hope to do. Uh, if our culture wants war so much because we're so militaristic, well, we're seeing the results of that. One other point, uh, not as a Democrat, because I'm not one, but I keep hearing of the Republicans who voted against Ukraine bill. What nobody looks at, and you can find it readily on this uh, in, you know, miracle called internet, is their explanations of why they voted against that. When you find so many other Republicans saying, yes, we need to spend more, we need to spend more. And the point is, they explained it as, well, we need to spend more in the war on China. We need to do uh, something sim others, you know, all these things, not in any high principle opposition to the war on Russia by way of Ukraine, but rather these very uh, narrow minded, narrow issues of uh, we need more war spending against China, for example, that was one of the predominant ones. And you can find that just by doing a search on internet. So I think we need to keep things at a higher level as far as trying to understand what's going on. Todd, I think you're, what you're referring to um, uh, the vote on NATO expansion on Finland. Finland right. That, Correct. Well, that, well, a couple of weeks ago. There's one vote in the Senate against it, right? Hawley. And Hawley made the argument that we shouldn't be doing, do, we shouldn't be putting more in NATO against Russia. That our real, the real war we ought to be fighting is with uh, China over Taiwan. And the same no, goes to that right. post bill of some months ago. Who did? Someone else? Okay. All right. Um, do you want to respond? Yeah. This is a, in part a re reply to reply to that gentleman, in, in part a reply to uh, uh, Anne. Uh, I, I think we need to remind ourselves and act upon the reality that most of he. I'm prompted to say this because he mentioned our culture of war, right? Uh, uh, I am entirely convinced that a proportion of Americans I'm not qualified to put a number on want nothing to do with this culture uh, that he's talking about, this warmongering and uh, so on. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it is it is a number of reasons why we're stuck in this situation, but I would I would say the press has a very, very profound uh, responsibility. To it. You know, I was uh, I was born mid-century, okay, but but uh, I, I sometimes think, wait a minute, in the mid '40s, Stalin was Uncle Joe, and then. Five years later, he was the most horrible fellow on the face of the earth. Well, maybe he was, I don't know, that's not my point. My point is, we can transform the public consciousness like that, you know, uh, the power of propaganda. 
propaganda like history is supposed to happen to other people. But we are, you know, since Bernays and all that, uh, the, 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 the policy cliques have figured out very well the extraordinary power of media and representation and orthodox narrative and so on and so forth, right? So I, I, I think uh, it's unfair to say, oh, most Americans are really high on this. I don't believe that to be the case. Patrick, we were, we were out of time now, but I give you a chance to uh, mention your new book, which is on this very subject of the corporate media. Uh -huh. Why don't you just address that as a closer? How kind of you, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just sold a book last week, not for a great sum, but that's another conversation. Um, uh, and um, some years ago, I was invited to write an essay uh, about the press. And I called it The Journalist in His Shadow. Um, I'll explain the title if you're interested, but let me spare you that for now. Um, and. Uh, it was uh, the the essay expanded into a book in short and i what i call the press mess i i i don't know you know my sister and people like that they they read the times they look at msnbc they don't know what under the sun is wrong um and that's part of what's wrong right um uh and uh i i decided that uh the, the gross derelictions of, uh, of the press in our time, and I will mention whether Miss Crittenton does not agree with me, right, as a former, former hack, if I may, um, uh, have a history. What's the history? It kind of goes back to Wolfgang's thesis. The press had a dreadful Cold War. When you read into it, the, the, it's just the monumental corruption, uh, dereliction of ethics, and so on and so forth. Maybe some of you will remember. Um, but they never admitted their mistakes. They never admitted failure. They never admitted they got it wrong. So what are they doing now? They're repeating it all. And I, I used to debate this with Steve Cohen, the late Russianist. Uh, you know, is this worse than the Cold War, or is it is it not as bad as the Cold War? And Steve used to say, "Oh no, it's it, it's not as bad as the '50s." Well, that was a few years ago. I think it's worse, right? So the book puts our current predicaments in a historical context. No, nobody's done that yet, right? Um, uh, the second thing it does is uh, my final chapter of only four, it's not that long a book, uh, is an argument for the emerging importance, and I'm quite convinced of this, and this is not angelism, the emerging importance of, of an independent press, right? Independent journalists, uh, I'm one of them. Uh, it's... Uh, it, it, it is I, emerging is the right is is the necessary word because uh, uh, these publications, the two I write for, Consortium News and Shear Post, they get read, but my sister in Kingston, New York, is not reading them except she reads my stuff. But uh, you know, uh, but if the dynamism and vitality of the the mainstream press is just. It's just so, it's, a, it's, it's sad, um, apart from alarming and a number of other things. Uh, but the dynamism and vitality of the profession is in the forward edge of independent publications. So, so that's the conclusion. And in the middle, I, I wove in some uh, memoir, my own half century in the great craft, in order to give it a narrative thread. That's the book. Published by... Uh, uh, okay.